Hello and welcome to this um, EPC uh, online 60 minute briefing. Uh, good afternoon to anyone in Europe and good morning to any colleagues joining us from across the Atlantic. Um, our theme today is EU-US relations, prospects for the transatlantic partnership. My name is David O'Sullivan. I'm chairman of the governing board of the EPC and uh, was previously the European Union ambassador in Washington. And I'm joined today by uh, Constanza Stenson-Muller, who doesn't need much introduction, I think, to anyone who follows uh, transatlantic affairs, but uh, who is the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and the transatlantic relations at the Brookings Institute uh, and comments extensively on these issues, including on the country she knows best, as we like to say in Brussels, uh, namely, namely Germany. Um, and we will uh, exchange views uh, for the next uh, 25, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then we will take questions from the audience. Um, I will say now what people most of the time say, uh, you know, there are two ways you can do questions. There's a Q&A widget, which you can write your question in. Uh, and I take a leaf from Jackie Davis's book and say, Please don't make it too long and please let there be a question mark at the end of it. Uh, and you can also, uh, in the participants, you can raise your hand uh, and that will show up in the participants list, which I think I have down here. And you can be, you can put your question directly uh, online. Uh, we'll need to unmute you, but I, if, I, if I call your name, then uh, Natalie will unmute you and you'll be able to speak directly. So that's the two ways in which you can, you can put questions. Well, Cassandra, um, you and I were together in Washington uh, during the dark years of the last, <laughs> the last administration. Uh, Not that you ever said it that way. No, well, well we <laughs> um, and, and I still got downgraded at one point. So, <laughs> but um, it, it was a, it was a difficult time for transatlantic relations. Uh, there is a huge new optimism uh, with the arrival of President Biden and his team, and, and what an impressive team it is, by the way, from a European perspective. I mean, with Tony Blinken, uh, Wendy Sherman as Deputy Secretary, uh, um, uh, Tori Newland back, uh, Amanda Sloat in, 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 in the NSC, all people who know uh, Europe very well and who have a strong commitment to the transatlantic relations. So there is a great deal of optimism. Yeah, on the other hand, you also hear um, people in Europe saying, well, we, we need to be wary of too much optimism because this administration is going to focus very much on domestic issues. The pandemic casts a long shadow over all of us on both sides of the Atlantic, both the public health aspects of that and the, the economic consequences, which are, are considerable. Um, and this administration has made it clear, I think it's, it's, its first priority is domestic. And we've already seen some of that with the the executive orders and by America and so forth. But you've been you've been preparing for this. Uh, you've been working. You've been in some working groups. Uh, a very very impressive paper produced by the um, Kennedy uh, Kennedy School of Government uh, with uh, two of the people I just mentioned who are actually on the on the group with you, uh, Toria and and Amanda Sloat. Um, and I think you also did something more specifically in German in Germany, uh, uh, a paper called "More Ambition." Um, may, could I could I ask you just to you know we'll, we'll go through the the, the the different issues which these papers raise sectorally, but in terms of the overall perspective, uh, should we should we should we be optimistic? Should we feel this is a moment to be seized, or do we need to be more prudent and and you know aware of the fact that President Trump still got a very substantial number of votes and while he may have lost the election, there are still many people who uh, clearly support the kind of policies that he was he was promoting during his the last four years. Well, uh, first off, uh, David, thank you very much for for inviting me um, to to speak to you about all this. Um, it's always nice to be in touch with people on the other side of the Atlantic after having, you know, been more or less cooped up in Washington since last March. Um, and I'm always sort of mildly entertained by by people who were diplomats in, uh, in, in, in the Trumpian era, sort of breathing a huge sigh of relief you know, <laughs> after retirement and after the end of this era, being able to uh, intimate what they actually thought. Um, but 
I mean, I, I, I do, I do feel you. Um, it was one of the reasons why I never, I just, I, I, I firmly told my parents that I was never going to apply for the foreign service in the first place. I don't think I would have been capable. But um, we, you know, yesterday we marked a normal Wednesday in January. And uh, this is not, you know, this is meaningful. Have the since we had the first Wednesday as Insurrection Day the second Wednesday of January as impeachment day and the third Wednesday is as inauguration day. I wish I could say that I marked yesterday with indolence. That's, that's not on the cards, sadly, but it's this feeling of professionalism, um, clarity, um, transparency of communication. It's, it's almost, you almost sit there and want to cry, you know, day by day as the Biden administration rolls out, it's clearly, uh, quite well prepared plans. But the, the truth is, of course, that the, the, the thing that also happened yesterday and which um, got some attention is that the Department of, Home, of Homeland Security, which, um, as people know, was created after 9-11 and was legendary for a while for always putting out these terror warnings uh, in, in uh, I think, what was it, in yellow, orange and red, depending on how high they, the threat they, the, uh, was and was roundly mocked for it for years and then stopped doing them. Now for the first time in a very long time, put out a, a generalized terror warning saying that they expected uh, more acts of domestic terrorism in, in the future. And I think that is a very serious point. It's um, a lot of the major news outlets have been following the, the uh, QAnon debates in, in chat groups and the dark web. And there is clearly a great deal of distress, concern, and, and willingness to, to use violence, and if anything, more violence than we saw on January 6th in the storming of the Capitol. So it's a very real concern, and, and the, the, the sense one gets living here in Washington in the middle of this pandemic is of two parallel realities. A return to the sort of organized, deliberative, carefully, set out normality of governance, and then the seething, hate-filled ocean of, of social unrest, where nobody knows whether it will sort of boil up into a tsunami again, as it did on January 6th, when that will happen, where it will happen, and how high the waves will be. That's a, that's, I mean, I, I think people need to keep in mind that that is, th that we are going to be living these two parallel realities for a while. I think that's, thank you. I, I think that's a very um, uh, good description of, of, the, of the situation uh, and the reality that we in, in Europe need to be aware of. I mean, I think we, we need to be aware that this is an administration which will, you know, which will be contested, which has a, a just about a majority in, 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 in Congress, but a, a slim one. Uh, uh, and which of course is, is, is going back to the practice of governing by executive order, which makes sense in the context, but which as we know, um, is, is not irreversible. And I was, I'm tempted to, to, you know, already mentioned 2024, but I'm not going to, but uh, because- Well, you could mention 2022, which is closer. Well, yes, this is true. Uh, uh, but uh, we, 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 we have to be, I think, sensitive to the fact that the administration is very much going to have domestic preoccupations, whether they're political, uh, public health or, or, or economic. Can I ask you, I mean, you're particularly specialized in, in security and foreign policy and defense issues. Um, let's look at the, the, the change in tone in, in that area. We had phone calls. Uh, to Secretary General Stoltenberg, both from the new uh, Secretary of Defense and indeed even from the President himself before he spoke to President Putin. Uh, we have a uh, um, renewed sense of, 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 of commitment to the transatlantic, uh, to, to NATO and to the alliance. Um, how, do you see, how do you see this impacting things and what do you think will be the, the expectations of this administration from Europe? I imagine in practical terms, they won't be totally different from some of the suggestions that Mr. Trump was making, even if couched in, in much more friendly and amicable terms. David, um, I know that I'm just a German, but I do have to deplore the fact that you were in America long enough to begin using the word impact as a verb. 
Oh, goodness. It, uh, it pains me. Well, yes. But... <laughs> you realize that Sorry, German, is, German, German is responsible for the, way, for, for the way that the Americans speak English, you know? <laughs> yeah, we'll always blame the Germans, of course. <laughs> um, the, look, I, I, think, I think that it's, um, you know, it's, it's a platitude, a truism to say that not everything the Trump administration thought or did was completely wrong, right? Um, it's, it is accurate to say that, that Europeans need to do more for their own defense and security. And it's also accurate, although the Trump administration would never have admitted it, that America has undergone a relative and perhaps even absolute decline of power as authoritarian powers like Russia and China have become more assertive and, and are asserting a global, in, certainly in the Chinese case, a global reach. Um, and that, that, has, that has consequences for, for Europe's self-defense, which apparently the Americans keep needing to have to remind us of. I find that personally astonishing, but there are, you know, there are, of course, in the middle of a pandemic, which has revealed, which has shone a brutal spotlight on the deficiencies, the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities of our domestic governance, there are competing priorities. And it has become clear that some of the deficiencies of our domestic governance, the weaknesses of law enforcement vis-a-vis violent populists that, that uh, want to undermine the state's monopoly on the exercise of, of, public, of public power. Um, these things are, are competing with, with the claims to greater investment in foreign policy and security. And I think we have to take that seriously. And I say that as a, as a security boffin. Um, but we've also, but the security boffins also understand that without domestic, without domestic governance working, there really isn't much of that you can then put towards effective and legitimate foreign and security policy. These things have to happen at the same time. And I'm very aware of that. And then on top of that, come global governance issues like pandemic management and climate change. And so it's, I think the, the Biden administration is, is absolutely right to tell us that we need to do more in our own interest. And we should be doing it regardless of what the Biden administration or anybody else is telling us. I agree completely with that. Um, but as you say, this is not necessarily a view shared, shared by, by a majority, a majority of the electorate in our different member states, and, and therein, therein lies the problem. But what do you think will be the approach of this administration to the issue of, of the EU doing more in this area, which is often put forward on the European side as a way of getting better value for money? I mean, of course, you have mm. a and commitment in, in NATO, and I'm sure uh, this administration will continue to push that, but we also know that in some countries uh, it may be very difficult to, to get to that level on, on purely national expenditure and the idea of doing more through European defence, uh, the initiatives which Feder Federica Mogherini took, um, the, the, the work that's going on, things like military mobility and so forth. Do you think there will be a, a, a rather more um, uh, helpful uh, approach taken to this, uh, provided, of course, that it's not in competition with NATO, which we would argue it is not. Um, or do you think they will also put the same emphasis as President Trump put on the question of buying American military kit, which sometimes seemed to be a particular obsession of his? Well, I mean, th this is one of the more obvious real differences with the Trump administration. The Trump administration famously was hostile to the whole notion of a, of a European Union thought it was a globalist project, um, uh, referred to by Mr. Trump himself as a foe. And, and he, 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 he repeatedly described the European Union as a, as a front for the Germans uh, to basically, um, you know, pull one over the Americans. Uh, that is obviously an understanding that you're not going to find in the Biden administration. I think, in fact, the, the the, the foreign policy experts um, 
in the Biden administration, and and as you said, some of the uh, some of them were until quite recently colleagues of mine, and others I know because, as you and I know, the Washington think tank circuit is you know is one where people know each other and know how they know how people think. Um, I don't think you're going to get a bunch of more of, of experts who are more knowledgeable and more generally open towards the EU in a very, very long time. It's, and in fact, that this may be, it's not impossible that, that this would, we would in retrospect look back on this and say, this was the last time we got a group of people that were, that had this much knowledge and this much sympathy. But I think the, the Biden team understands two things. Um, one is that most European nation states, and, and I frankly, as a German would say that's true even for the big three, for, for, the, for the UK, um, for France and, and for Germany, are struggling to provide the full spectrum of governments, never mind security capabilities, that uh, a, an effective nation state is expected to provide for a variety of reasons. And obviously the smaller a European state gets, the more difficult that is. That's just the reality of interdependence and globalization. And so the European Union is a real equalizer and, and power leverager for the small nations, but it is also indispensable for the big three. And it's what the Brits having just left are now finding out at tremendous cost is that it, it entails a genuine, a hugely painful loss of power and leverage for them. And not just within Europe with regard to their European neighbors, but in the world in general. And that if you sort of then spin this thought forwards as such, the, as a block, as a block of trading power and regulatory power, uh, dipl diplomatic power and development aid muscle, the, the EU is an enormous asset to America at a time when America itself has to come to terms with a relative loss of power and looking at the rise of authoritarian powers with global ambitions. In that context, uh, I see that Joe Leinen uh, has a question which I think would fit in at this moment, which is what, what do you judge the idea of Joe Biden to organize a summit of democracies? How do you, I mean, you've been, you've been you know, talking with people who are now in the administration around Washington. Um, I mean, for some people, this is, this is, this is a, a, an attractive idea, but it's also an idea not without some, some degree of risk in terms of how it can be perceived by yeah. the majority of countries around the world which are not democracies but so how do you what do you what are your thoughts on yeah. this? so well i will say that i wrote the democracy action plan in the in the paper you so kindly referenced at the beginning the the stronger together piece which was a uh, report which was co-convened not just just by harvard's kennedy school and nick burns but the german council on foreign relations led by my friend daniela schwarzer um but I think um, a lot has been written already about the um, Summit of Democracies ideas, uh, among others by my, my friend and colleague Jim Goldgeier or Ed Luce in the FT. And I think, and, and it's one of the reasons why that democracy action plan, which I wrote, doesn't mention it. Um, I, I think it's a bad idea. I think even the D10 is a bad idea because it, it puts the question of which country is a democracy and under what conditions front and center and, and, and you sort of waste your time on definitional questions and, and uh, debates with some countries that are definitely in a gray zone, despite the fact that they're members of Western alliances or the European Union, and in, instead of actually getting to work on what really matters. And, and so I'm, I'm against it. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think that the likelihood of the Biden administration quietly dropping it uh, is fairly substantial. I mean, on, conversely, as anybody who, who sort of knows me would probably imagine, I am violently in favor of uh, the European Union being much more um, muscular in requiring its member states to adhere to democratic standards and rule of law 
and all, all the other all the other fundamental foundational principles that come with representative democracy and thus doing the same thing in NATO and in fact the EU and NATO member states working with each other well I mean most of them are in the same organization anyway um, to do this and 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 also you know that 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 then is the precondition for supporting democracy abroad um, in you know states like Taiwan opposition movements in Belarus in Hong Kong and, and in Russia. And how do you think- Think kind of one, sorry. <laughs> how, how do you think then, you know, that we'll come back to China in, 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 in a few minutes because it's, it's, a, it's a chapter in itself, I think, but mm -hmm. um, turning to, you know, some of the countries you mentioned, Russia, uh, Belarus, and so forth. How do, do you, how do you think this, this administration will, will view the balance between um, the sort of very legitimate uh, issues of, of human rights, of democracy, of um, uh, uh, in the case of Belarus, of, of even you know uh, regime change, perhaps in, in extreme circumstances, uh, versus the sort of real politique of, of you know trying to find some some engagement and some accommodation with with particularly with with Putin. Um. Look, I don't think that the Biden administration is uh, is naive, so it's not going to say human rights and democracy promotion are the be all and end all of our foreign policy. What they are saying, and in fact, the president has said, is that these are the foundational principles from which we must never depart, which is why we will not be, to use a wonderful American term, schmoozing with the autocrats in, in the way that the, that the predecessor government was, which had a distinct affection for some of the nastier autocrats, even, even when, they, when they sawed up opposition, oppos, op, um, opposition figures, wrapped them in carpets and, and smuggled them out of consulates, as you remember the, the, the Saudis did with Jamal Khashoggi. Mm. Um, that that never deterred Donald Trump from embracing from embracing um, the, the the Saudi regime. That I think we can we can firmly re rely on on the Biden administration doing no such thing. And in fact, they've already made it clear to to the Saudis and to others that they intend to be a lot a lot cooler. But the 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 truth is, of course, that you that the the Biden administration is well aware that it is going to need to have conversations. Um, and cooperation with uh, the Russians and with the Chinese on certain issues of global governance, beginning with climate change and the pandemic. And the readouts of the president's first phone calls have made that very clear, but it also, they've also made it very clear that they intend to firmly, firmly uh, demarcate red lines and not as, you know, not engage in, a, in, a, in, a, in a across the board, um, you know, not give them blank checks for, for either for their behavior domestically or, or abroad, which, which is already a very welcome change. And I think in some ways a deterrent, as we saw from the Kremlin's and, 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 the, and, the, and the Chinese government's responses, which were very carefully calibrated. And, and I think uh, showed that, that it has been understood in Moscow and Beijing that, that there is now a different tone coming out of Washington. And do you think there could also be a different tone taken with uh, some of the countries within the European Union with, with whom there are potentially issues of uh, the rule of law and uh, respect for, for full democracy? Well, I am going to make myself unpopular with a certain embassy in Washington and say that uh, for the past four years, uh, the Hungarians were walking around Washington as though they owned the town. I doubt that that's going to be the case in the future. You know, the, 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 the Oman government felt fully and completely welcomed, approved of and validated by the Trump administration. And um, I mean, you can, you can have an argument about whether the, the sort of open disapproval of the Obama administration did anything to make, the, to make the Orban government change its course on anything. But, but, the, but the sort of you know, full-throated approval coming from the Trump administration also did a great deal of damage to cohesion in Europe on this issue. And I think the Biden administration has, will make it very clear that nothing of the kind is going to be forthcoming from them, which is good. 
I mean, more, a more tricky question is is Poland, obviously. Yes. Where which is which is more of a gray zone, which has a larger, I mean, which has a very large and determined civil society Indeed. that is that objects to the the uh, rejigging of 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 the of the Polish courts um, and other sort of clearly authoritarian measures. Uh, undertaken by the Polish government, but, but it's qualitatively different from the wholesale rewriting of the, of the constitution to favor one party rule that the Orban government has, has done. So I think there, there, the, you have a real gray zone and, a, and, and which treats, needs to be treated with a lot more subtlety. I'm going to um, take a uh, few questions from our uh, listeners or viewers. I'm never entirely sure what you say in a webinar. Um, uh, the first I see that John Palmer has put his hand up to ask a question. John, if you're there, can we, uh, Natalie, can you un unmute John? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can, John. Great. I, I'd like very much, I'm very struck by the opening remarks that Constance made about the big question marks over the future of the United States domestic polity uh, with all the issues of democracy, uh, the challenge from the far right, etc. And I'd like to hear her opinion and yours too, David, on uh, how you see the likely trajectory of the Republican Party in the postscript to all the dramas of recent weeks. Are they going to be a party that will try to smother the far right into some kind of uh, uh, center right uh, conventional party? Uh, will they bend more to the influence of the growing far right? Uh, and is a, sp a, a splinter of the Republican Party the most likely outcome? A a any views? Thank you very much, John. Good to hear from you. Um, Constanza, you can go first. <laughs> um, I mean, that obviously is the $64 million question. And as of now, I would say that the international, the institutionalist, faction of the GOP is, is absolutely on the defensive. Um, there was a moment when it was thought that Mitch McConnell might swing towards the other side, towards the institutional side. When he said that um, the mob that stormed the Capitol on the 6th, resulting in the death of five people, um, had been incited by the president and by other powerful people. What he omitted to mention was that he had been one of those powerful people. Um, that much of the behavior, I mean, I'm not saying that Mitch McConnell performed incitement per se, but I would say that the, that the consistent denial of the legitimacy of the election outcome after November 3 by Mitch McConnell and, and most of the leadership of the Republican Party created an enabling and legitimizing framework for a, a seething, boiling mood that was very clearly prone to violence, that was very clearly organizing and arming itself. And I think, you know, if, even if you, if you say there shouldn't be criminal accountability for this, uh, there is certainly a debate about political and moral accountability to be had. Um, and I and I think I when I when I say that 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 is a feeling that is echoed among uh, much of the traditional uh, never Trumper part of uh, the the Republican political landscape. Um, there are a variety of questions here. The, the the most important one is what happens to Trump? Will Trump form his own you know develop his own political platform? Will it just be a media platform? And what are his personal plans for 2024 or for his family? I think that's not, there are rumors about that, but it's not entirely clear yet. On that depends the political future of the younger pretenders, such as Nikki Haley, um, Pompeo, and of course, uh, the, the young senator from Missouri, Josh Hawley, um, who famously raised his fist to the, to the insurrectionists. And then people like Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and others. But I think the first three that I named are probably the most ambitious and serious contenders for power in the Republican Party, and who clearly have no intention whatsoever to disassociate themselves from the more extreme wing of the Republican Party, including the QAnon wing. 
And then you have the, the, the question um, of what's happening in the states and what is happening in the House and the Senate. Um, the House now, as we know, has, has uh, at least two members who are Q QAnon adjacent, as, as we say now here in Washington, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Florida and Lauren Burbett from Colorado, both of whom have um, made the most extraordinary pronouncements. Um, and the, there's still a question around Lauren Burbett having, having shown um, tourists, quote unquote, around, uh, around the Capitol a day before the in insurrection. And then finally, there have been really alarming, alarming um, statements out of some of the state GOPs. The Arizona GOP uh, put out a statement two days ago that um, in, its, in its logo said, we are the storm, which is a QAnon, which is a QAnon slogan used before the insurrection. The Texas GOP did something quite similar not quite as alarmingly close in its rhetoric to QAnon, but, but uh, similarly in denial of the election outcome. And, and that, is th that, that conflict, I think, is only in its beginnings. I'm sorry, I can't tell you where this will go, but I have to say I'm pessimistic at this point. I, I mean, just to add my contribution, I, I, I share that analysis, but I'm, I'm also rather more pessimistic. Um, uh, Good Lord. <laughs> and I was, I was pessimistic um, uh, when I saw the, the degree of the hostile takeover that uh, President Trump was able to achieve during his, his four years. And I must say, when you look at the election results, I mean, while President Biden won and, and won well, uh, the fact is President Trump got a lot of votes uh, and, and the, the Republican Party didn't do too badly. OK, they, they, you know, in the end, they lost the Senate, which came as a bit of a surprise, I think, that the Democrats could seize those two seats in Georgia. Um, but if you are looking at this from the perspective that you've just described, I think the, 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 the moderates will have a hard time persuading people that moderation is the way to, 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 to go forward in, in 2024. I, I fear that's the case. Uh, Philippe de Bouc has asked a question um, which is linked to this, which would be what would be the impact of the, the impeachment trial in, in all of this? Is it, is it counterproductive or is it, uh, um, uh, is, it, is it something which had to be done? Look, um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by training. So I would say that um, I think that the, the uh, argument advanced now by the likes of Mark, Senator Marco Rubio that uh, this is unconstitutional because, it, uh, the, because the president is no longer in office is, is legally spurious. Um, the, the value of, of, this, um, of this proceeding is twofold. One, because it establishes um, a, a court-proof body of evidence. It puts, it puts facts on the record, including witness, uh, witness interviews, videos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and not, you know, not just for, for the impeachment trial, but also for, for the use of politics and, and historians. I think that is a absolutely key function of this process. Um, and while I, it also um, has the, I think, important political function of forcing the GOP to show its hand and to, to declare its, its position on the behavior of Trump and his enablers in the matter of the insurrections. That is also important. And it, um, you know, in a normal, in a normal political environment, you would, you would think it would help Republican moderates and, and, and the Democrats. And finally, um, I mean, there is the point of nobody expects there to be an actual impeachment, which of course would, would lead to a, a prescription of the president. In other words, it would, it would forbid him from ever holding public office again. And the point has been made that there is another, um, and, and, and another provision, the, the 14th Amendment, I think it is, which would uh, enable some, uh, a similar outcome with a smaller normal majority rather than the supermajority required by impeachment. That's been advanced by constitutional scholars, but I think that that, um, I don't know why the, why the first route has been taken and not the second, or whether they could be, uh, they, they could be deployed in parallel. I think that's, that's still to be decided.
Okay, thank you. Um, I see um, Adam Isaacs from the European Parliament has put his hand up. Uh, Adam, if you're still with us, uh, can you be... Um, oh, you... No, well, I was going to suggest unmuting him, but I see he's dropped off. So um, Lars, Lars Holgaard has, has a question. Lars. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you, David. And thank you, Constance. Uh, I totally agree and share your preoccupations with the uh, very serious developments in the uh, Republican Party. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's also the other half or more of the voters who would not be able to identify with QAA and, and other extreme views. So isn't this process, if Trump continues and will mobilize his, his base, isn't that leading to a destruction of the Republican Party uh, and be making it unelectable? Well... I mean, I think my answer to that is that 74 million American voters voted for a Republican party that was saying just these things. Mm. And I think that that already, and, and, the, and the reactions from the state GOPs that I cited to you, you know, demonstrate just how far the toxic rot has gone, just how far people are living in alternate factual universes. Um, and a lot of there's been a lot of reporting on these universes uh, since the election, and there are um, clearly a lot of people across the United States who firmly believe that the November 3 election was stolen and that Trump is the only legitimate president. Um, that, and this despite about 60 courts, many of them with Republican judges nominated by President Trump having said the opposite. That, that I think should give you pause for thought. I, I find this, uh, I mean, I, you know, again, as a, as a person who attempts to work with facts and as a lawyer by training, I cannot tell you how much this distresses me um, and, and how, you know, I, I would just remind all of us that it was only in the fall of last year that a, a QAnon group in Germany attempted to storm the Bundestag they were stopped, barred from entry by three policemen. Um, but then the alternative for Germany, Germany's hard right populist party, um, gave visitors passes to a, a small gaggle of QAnon followers who then proceeded to harass, denounce and, and, and videotape members of the Bundestag in the building. Um, it's not as though this kind of stuff didn't exist in Europe, and for that matter, in my country. In fact, Germany, I think, has the largest following of QAnon in in uh, in Europe, and and that hasn't gone away either. So I I would you know I would urge all of us not to think that what's happening over here isn't reproducible in Europe. I see Adam has um, you have re-established contact with Adam. Can we can we unmute him? Uh. Thank you, David. Uh, you, uh, we remember that um, the Parliament had a delegation over there when you were you learned of your downgrading by the Trump um, administration back in 2018. And my question really relates to uh, something in the news with the UK thing. Um, to what extent will the US um, US relationship with this this tr triangle that they're talking about? US, EU, UK, will that become a feature? To what extent do you expect um, the Biden administration to put pressure on the UK to stop being so silly over the diplomatic relationship? And what can the European, what can the institutions do? What can we in the parliament do to, um, to downplay the, um, the difficulties in this area? What lessons can we learn from that experience? Well, I, uh, I, can Go I just, just no, no, yeah. just, just because I think it's important. Uh, Absolutely, I've made the the um, uh, sort of analogy between my, what happened to me um, and and what is currently happening to, to Java exactly in in London. Uh, it's yeah. completely different um, because uh, there was no downgrading of the, the the diplomatic relations as such. It, it all had to do with, frankly, 
deeply embarrassingly sort of trivial issue of you know where I where I came in the protocol ranking, um, which I can assure you was of no concern at all to me, other than as a matter of principle under the circumstances. But um, uh, so it was completely different. I mean, the UK is 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 proposing actually not to recognise the full diplomatic status of of the EU delegation and the EU ambassador in London, which is a completely different thing. I don't think I don't want to get too sidetracked into into that issue. But um, Constanza, do you want to pick up on maybe which from Adam's point, which is I think where where in this do, do we get the the UK the, the triangular relationship? How is that going to be? How is that going to be managed? I mean. Clearly, uh, they will want good relations with the UK. It's an important partner, ally, friend, and so forth. Um, on the other hand, it's slightly uncomfortable to have this um, these squabbles going on in Europe. Yes. Well, I mean, D David knows that that I, um, you know, had the, the 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 pleasures of an of an English childhood because my because my dad was posted to London when I was a when I was a baby, um, and that sort of never quite leaves you. Um, I mean, it's, I'm sorry to, to get sentimental over this, but you know, to my parents who are war children coming to London in the, in the early sixties um, was enormously, I, I felt it was both liberating and civilizing. And, and I, you know, one of the things that I remember my dad who had been a 17 year old POW saying to me, um, when I when I was an adolescent was that we could rely on the Americans and the English never to do the kind of uh, horrific crimes that the Germans had perpetrated in the 20th century because they you know they, these were sane and decent people with functioning constitutional orders um, and you know that's obviously sort of come to my mind a lot in these past years um, and I, and I, you know, as a particularly as a young journalist, um, spent a great deal of time in London, going around the SEO and the MOD um, and, and Whitehall, sort of, frankly, learning from British civil servants. Um, and so I, I personally, really, really, am distressed by by how this Brexit has come about. And not least because I think it's, you, you know, this is, seems to me to point to some much deeper turmoil in, in the English soul and some sort of fundamental uh, trouble in English society. But we, I think all of us understand that Europe and the transatlantic relationship is stronger with a strong Britain than without it. And I think every effort needs to be made for the European Union to be able to work with this newly sovereign, as I think they want to think, Britain. And, and I think, you know, it's every effort should be made and no obstacles should be placed in their way. But I also see, you know, you, you, I mean, you know, seeing the pictures of angry Scottish self, shellfish vendors. Um, I'm seeing the, as what David just referenced, the, this, I think, entirely silly uh, British decision not to recognize European diplomats. That strikes me as, as just petty and unconstructive. And we need the Brits for so many things. This is ridiculous. I'm sorry, I, I get, as, I'm, this is much no, longer than very, even, I get most wrong about this. You, uh, I, I think yeah. many of us would, would, share, would share the sympathy and uh, yeah. sympathies and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have other occasions to come back on it, by the way. But by the way, the EPC, and I, I forgot to mention in, in amongst Consensus considerable uh, uh, qualities and capacities, she has also accepted to join the Strategic Council of the EPC for which we're very grateful. Well, um, I'm sorry, the honor is mine, but, um, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, and um, uh, the EPC is going to be working on, on track two activities with uh, trying to improve relations between the EU and, and the UK, uh, also in a, in a, in a strictly non-governmental sense, because we think that's, that's going to be very important. And I think we need to just move on a little bit to some of the other issues that are going to be there. We're not going to have time to deal with them all, I'm afraid, trade, uh, China, 
uh, big tech stuff. Uh, you, 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 this is all covered in the report to which you contributed. You, you, you wrote the bit on democracy, but you, you presumably participated in the discussions on some of the other stuff. Of course. Uh, Paul Taylor, yeah, all of them. <laughs> Paul Taylor is asking you, asking us to, asking you actually, uh, the, 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 the easy question, you know, which, which is going to be the most difficult issue between Europe and the, and the new administration? Is it, is it the trade friction? Is it the, the, the tech stuff or, or is it China um, or, you know, none of the above? Hello, Paul. Nice to hear from you. Um, as you know, it's going to be all of the above and the, and the problem is precisely that all, the things, all of these things run into each other. The, there is no, there's no way of insulating, of sort of taking issues out and trying to take them separately. Um, but the overarching concern, I think, really is the transatlantic alliance's relationship with China. Because of China's global ambitions, uh, its hegemonic uh, behavior, um, and, and, its, and, and its bullying on the world stage. That, that will, I think, bleed into every, every transatlantic issue that there is. Not least because China has become such a visible force within Europe and not just in the South Pacific or in Europe's periphery or in the Middle East. And, but I, I have the impression uh, that listening to Johnny Blinken, I'm particularly thinking to a, a thing he did with the uh, US Chamber uh, a few weeks before the election, uh, where he talked quite a lot about China, um, uh, and that this administration nonetheless is, is, is going to take a more nuanced view of relations with China in the sense of you know, understanding that you need to confront on those things which you dislike and which are, are, are you know, major problems, but at the same time that we will need engagement. How could we have a, a success of COP26 if, if China isn't on board and, and engaged in the climate change discussion? How can we rebuild the JCPOA if, if China is not uh, playing a, at least a, not a spoiling view role uh, around the table? Honestly, I, I don't think that, <coughs> that that's... Uh, these are not mutually exclusive things. I think, in fact, that if uh, the clearer it is that there are hard red lines on which there can be no compromise, um, the, the easier it will be to have some of these other conversations. Um, and the simple reason for that is interdependence, which the, the Chinese and the Russians, for that matter, are trying to weaponize one way in our direction. But, um, and the... I would, I think it, it behooves us to remember that there is, as we've now seen over the past weekends, significant fragility in Russia. And I would assume there, that I would assume that there are similar issues going on in China that we know, just know less about and that are less visible. And Russia needs trade, China needs trade. These relationships, interdependence works both ways. And the, the, the fact is that Europe and America, particularly when they act together, have far more leverage vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian powers than they often choose to deploy. And I, and I suggest that we um, assert that vigorously. And then, and then I think it is perfectly legitimate on a, on a sort of realist understanding of the cooperation that we need to, need to have to work with these powers on certain issues as long as it, as it is always made utterly clear, with no room for doubt, that fundamental principles will not be compromised. And the, the uh, I won't say the conclusion, because it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was politically concluded, it hasn't been signed, but the, uh, the spat over the um, comprehensive uh, agreement on investment, which uh, we, 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 the Europeans, tentatively concluded, politically at least, with, with China at the end of the year. Um, you, met, you, wrote, you mentioned that in your piece for, for foreign policy. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear to me whether you, um, what, your, what your view of the issue was. I mean, uh, many on the European side would say this, we've been negotiating this for seven years. Uh, we had finally got a breakthrough uh, on some of the substantive stuff, which you know, people are now looking at because text is beginning to appear, which we hadn't seen before, and people are taking different views about it. Um, it would have been it would have been rather foolish to sort of somehow say, well, sorry, we have to put all this on hold and, and we'll we'll consult with a, an incoming U.S. administration. On the other hand, it was clear 
uh, um, that some on the American side, it, it, the timing was, was most unhelpful and, and seemed to uh, already sort of um, uh, jump the gun a bit on, 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 on future, future cooperation. What's your, what's your sense mm -hmm. of how this was all felt in, in Washington? Well, I, um, I, I find myself, uh, as, as are they so often, um, uh, sort of firmly in the middle of this particular debate. <laughs> Um, and I think it's completely disingenuous to suggest that this, you know, was just business as usual. Um, it's for the Chinese, it's clearly a political and strategic uh, agreement. And one that I think gives very little to the Europeans and a not insignificant sig uh, symbolic gain to the Chinese. But it in no way precludes a larger more, more wide ranging uh, conversation and cooperation between America and, and Europe on China. And it doesn't sort of lock the, the, the Europeans and, and the Germans into a relationship that then you know, precludes them talking to Washington. So I, I thought that Jake Sullivan's tweet was uh, a little, uh, you know, while sort of very carefully worded and very polite, also sounded a little helpless, um, and I and I think um, I think that the sort of much more measured uh, and careful reaction to the agreement uh, a couple of weeks later, I think, was was warranted. And in in some ways, and I think I did write that in my FP piece, uh, that this was an own goal, um, not just for the Commission but for the German presidency, because it sort of puts the burden of proof on the European side to to uh, to sort of explain to Washington that this doesn't you know somehow hamper them from a larger conversation um, and in that sense you know it's less of an achievement or le less of an achievement for for Beijing than it than it would look at first glance so I'm I tend to be moderately relaxed about this more more than some of the hawks here but um, I do think that we now need to get serious about this. I'm, as you know, unhappy about Nord Stream 2, um, but there again, I also think that the Hawks, you know, are engaged in a sort of deadlock and, and that obscures the, you know, any, any potential for a sane sort of, you know, a sane compromise. Yeah, I, I mean, on the investment agreement, I, I, I largely share your views. I, I, I think it's, it's a bit, unfair to say that it doesn't give anything to the Europeans. I think that the dilemma which, which presented itself was the fact that it actually did give quite a lot of the, the substantive asks of the Europeans. I agree with you that it was no accident the timing from a Chinese point of view. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, you, 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 take your, you take your opportunities as, as they arise. And the other point I would make is that this is not yet a done deal. So when people say, oh, you've already sort of sold the family silver, in fact, uh, this is we're, we're not going to sign a text until well into the, into into this year, and it'll have to be ratified. And the parliament is going to have a lot to say about it. So actually, <laughs> if anything, it's it's an element of leverage in both directions. I mean, the Chinese can 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 refuse to to sign off. We we can refuse to sign off. So, but I, I agree with you. I think the more important and substantive point is that this is an area on which we need urgently a, a, a discussion and the development of, of some kind of common strategy and approach, which can be, I think, differentiated. There could be some division of labor. We don't have to be in perfect agreement on all issues at all times, because that's uh, uh, probably going to be difficult. But basically, we do need a, a sort of common understanding of how we're going to play uh, this situation, which is, and I agree with you, you know, one of the, the, the big, big challenges to, to, to all of us in, in the 21st century. And, uh, we, we're going to need a, uh, a lot of wisdom. Um, I, I suppose we're, we're winding up, and it's really been a treat, uh, Constanza. And, and thank you, thank you very much for for joining us. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. You have fantastic insights, and uh, uh, very good understanding of both sides of the Atlantic, which is which is uh, going to be needed. Um, how do you think? My final question will just be to: sort of, How do you think this this plays out now? You know, do we do we set up new structures? Do we have a do we have a sort of high level meeting? How do we how do we make this new relationship work? Uh, and, and how do we do that in 
it relatively quickly because one of the things I sense is, you know, we need to seize this opportunity that we've got, you know, four years, or as you've reminded me, two years to the, the midterms. Uh, we, we need to show progress uh, fairly quickly across a number of areas. Is there, have you given any thought to how you do that? Uh, yep. <laughs> In Good. fact, the reports I was a part of uh, contain a number of some very specific ideas. But just to reinforce briefly the quest, the point about the midterms, um, you know, it's people like to say that, oh, you know, with 306 uh, uh, votes in the Electoral uh, College, uh, Joe Biden's uh, got a comfortable majority. That's not true. Um, not only is the Senate 50-50, with Kamala Harris as the um, the the deciding uh, the tiebreaker, which essentially means that she becomes a Senate manager for the next two years, um, with probably little little bandwidth for anything else. But um, I think you know dozens of of Democratic seats in the House were gained with margins of less than two percent. Uh, which means that they are very much at risk in two years, particularly because uh, the American voting, uh, the American electorate likes to have divided government. Um, the, the, the political tradition is after two years of testing out a new president to, to give him a, a house that's against him. So the Biden administration is fully aware that it has, it has two years and you know, as, as things stand, less than two years usually because you've, you know, it's normally sort of 14, 18 months to get things done. And the, the speed, discipline, um, and, and just quantity of, of decisions that they have put out since, taking, since the president taking office on the 20th is indicative of their understanding of just how short that time span is. They've become, they've come extremely well prepared. And I, I, for one, am praying that the Europeans, you know, had a sense of this beforehand and are equally well prepared. I mean, I will say in fairness that I thought that um, after, after November 3rd, at least in my country, in Germany, there was a, sort of, I thought, carefully calibrated sequence of statements um, from the top echelons of the president, the chancellor, the foreign minister, I think the defense minister, AKK, gave three speeches. And of course, we saw the, the proposal of a new transatlantic deal from the commission, all of which designed to say, we are here for you. And, and I frankly, you know, I, I think that it, it would be useful for the, the alliance to do two things. One, to broaden the scope of our conversation beyond traditional foreign and security policy issues. And secondly, to institutionalize them somewhat, to make, in other words, to, for there to be a consistent institutionalized conversation rather than the usual sort of hopping from one G7 summit to a NATO defense ministerial and so on, because then issues get dropped in, in between. And that I think would would make the make the relationship and the and the changes we need to bring to it um, deeper, stronger, and more resilient against the the future shocks that we know will come. I mean, let's not forget that in the past decade we've seen global financial crisis, migration crisis, Ukraine crisis, the election of Trump, um, the rise of populism across the West, and and the rise of authoritarian powers. In, in, and, and, and their attempts to influence politics in both America and Europe. These, these are things that, that we didn't, you know, didn't think about 10 years ago and that didn't really fit, come into, let's say, the last, the last NATO strategic concept. It is very clear that we need a, a sort of denser and stronger tissue to the relationship for it to be able to, to survive against the next series of shocks which will come. And of course, I just left out the pandemic, but there you go. There'll be more of all of the other. Thank you. Those, that's a very good uh, tone on which to, to bring this to, to a conclusion. I also agree with you that um, this is a unique opportunity to, to reinvent this relationship. And as you say, to, to put it on a footing which can resist perhaps future changes which, which might come. Uh, and we should, we should seize that opportunity.
Cosenza, thank you very much for being so generous of your time. Uh, thanks for, for your insights. Uh, we look forward to, to continuing the discussion on future occasions. Uh, and uh, thanks to all our uh, participants. Uh, and uh, with that, we will, we will close the meeting. Thank you very much. And I just say thank you. And you are much missed in Washington. You were a wonderful EU ambassador to have here. And you have a lot of friends here. So I hope that at some point you'll be able to visit us again. I'd, lo I'd, love, I'd love to get back. That's the problem. <laughs> thank okay. you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Take care.